The legend is that the bells of Shandon not only ring out over Cork, the second city of Era, but call her sons back from all over the world. Certainly this is true of Frank O'Connor. Sometime librarian, sometime railway clerk, sometime director of the Abbey Theatre, Dublin, gunman in the fight for Irish independence, visiting professor of literature in Stamford University, California, and at all times, and always, a writer. Acknowledged, particularly in America, perhaps, as the leading Irish writer of his day. His two main bases are New York and Dublin. But rarely a year passes without his coming back from wherever he is, in Europe or America, to spend a few days here in Cork. The city draws him. This is where he was born, and this is where he constantly returns. He lived here, hardly ever left the place, until he was 28. Ten years too old. You see, I feel about uh, towns and cities that just like human beings, they uh, have a mental age of their own. I'd hate to show you some small towns in Ireland where the age limit is 12. But after all, I mean, the Dublin, though it lets on to be a capital and all the rest of it, uh, has a, a mental age limit of uh, roughly uh, 25, shall we say. Now you place Cork somewhere between these two and you can say the uh, mental age of Cork is 18 and a half. I'm not absolutely clear what you mean by a mental age limit. Well, the, the mental age limit really defines the period as uh, which a young man or woman of talent ought to pack his bags and get out. And in that sense, you left Cork ten years too late. Ten years too late, and I'm still trying to make up for lost time. However, when you come into Cork, there is no doubt, coming in from the outside anyway, that uh, uh, architecturally it has all the marks of... Uh, of a provincial capital. You don't have to sell Cork to me, Hugh. After all, to me, it's the most important city in the world. It doesn't have the spectacular Georgian beauty of Dublin, but it has uh, a quiet regency charm of its own. You always feel that Dublin is going to get up and uh, address you as if you were a public meeting. But in Cork, you get the impression that at any moment you may meet one of Jane Austen's old ladies among the bow-fronted houses. And I suppose it is good to see pretty things before you're old enough to appreciate them, to have the feeling of beauty before you get the idea of it. But for me, the beautiful houses are just places where Mother worked as a charwoman and where I went to pick her up at six o'clock. The Mardike, a bit of a mess nowadays, I'm afraid, is where I used to dream of taking a girl one night after dark, and never did, because I was afraid she'd notice the patch in my trousers. Beauty you've lived with up to the age of 16 isn't in your head. Actually, I'm the last to notice it. But it's there inside you all right, like your blood and bones. All the same, though the outside looks fine, it's a different matter when you have to live here. There's that business of mental age, for instance. I don't know exactly how you judge the mental age of a town, but one way is certainly by its bookshops and libraries, art galleries and theatres and concerts. And if you judge Cork by these, you'll see that 18 and a half isn't an unfair estimate. Of course, that's largely the influence of a church which is provincial to the core. I know that Bonn University in Germany was recently searching for a complete set of the work of Leo Flaherty, a fine writer by any standard, and all the libraries in Ireland put together couldn't produce a set. I'm quite certain they couldn't produce a set of mine, four, or is it five of my books are banned by law. You may say that my books are bad, but surely you'd expect a city like this to have a complete set of the works of even its worst writer. That's what I call provincialism. To be provincial is to be deprived. I suppose the mark of provincialism is 
the fact that there is no intellectual atmosphere in which a man can grow up, in which he can develop himself fully after the age of 18 or 20 or even 25. There's something that happens in after that, I think he tends to become bitter, to be disappointed, to resent other people's achievement, and to belittle it. In a town like Cork, you'd be astonished at the, the dirtiness of people's tongues, merely because they haven't themselves achieved all that was in them to achieve. I think that's the secret of a provincial humor, which is nearly always malicious and always belittling. There must be some advantage, however, in uh, living on the periphery rather than in the center. It's in the provinces. It's in a, a city like this that character is shaped. And up to a certain point, uh, character is all that matters. After that, individuality has to take over. And somehow or other, the man's full individuality must be expressed. You're suggesting that you, Frank O'Connor, wouldn't have been the writer that you are had it not been that you'd left Cork. I'm quite certain I wouldn't have been the writer I am, whatever that may be. But uh, I think there's a strong possibility that if I hadn't been brought up in Cork, I wouldn't have been a writer at all. Because as a boy here, I learned certain things about life that a lot of people don't know. The real values, the values of poverty, servile poverty. Because there was poverty here in those days, and there still is. Behind all the gracious houses, there are the lanes of little country cabins, each of them with its two rooms and the loft overhead. And not a few dozen of them either, but scores, hundreds perhaps of them. Goulding's Lane, Keeling's Lane, Arch Lane, Medipo Lane. They may not look so squalid now, but believe me, they were hell to live in. I spent the first six years of my life in 251 Blarney Lane, my mother and father and myself sleeping in the one tiny room. And mind you, we were aristocrats compared with the families of eight and ten who lived and died in them. Oh yes, they died in them too, rather than go to the infernal workhouse. I was only a baby when my mother one day put me down on a chair in one of these cabins and I saw her through the bedroom door saying the last prayers over a young fellow who was dying of a tubercular hemorrhage. Out of the depths have I cried to the O Lord, Lord, hear my prayer. Out of the depths, all right. It was no wonder if the men cleared out to the pub and the women became slovenly and hopeless. The place is poor enough now, you know, but up to 1914, the average domestic income there was about 12 shillings. Even up to 1939, it was scarcely more than a pound. Of course, in wartime, it mounted to something like 30 shillings. So there was nothing else for the men to do but enlist in the British Army. And naturally, from the women's point of view, it was a real blessing to have one exacting adult out of the house. 1914 to 1918 was in some ways the happiest period of my life. But there was more than that to it. Those old sweats who went off to die so that their wives could have the separation money, the women who used it to bring up large families in two rooms, had heroic stuff in them. Old soldiers become a sort of secret society, you know. Uh, they know what war is really like. And we who came out of the slums are a secret society too. We know what that poverty was like and we allow no outsider to criticize one of us. That sense of community is something that belongs to the provincial town. It has a set of moral standards all its own, and the standards are so forthright that they give the individual the chance of breaking them as a responsible moral agent.